there have been several people that have said it's, it's going to be like a worldwide revival and uh, going to result in like a billion souls being saved. Oh my goodness, hallelujah. And uh, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yes. We want to see people saved above all other things. And, uh, if you're not a part of Mom's Time Out, please pray for them tomorrow. Um, and we've got Ted's memorial service on uh, Saturday at 11 o'clock. And, uh, and we're just, uh, we've entered a very busy season. And uh, <laughs> I have a, a memorial service to do Saturday and Sunday afternoon. And, <laughs> and so... We've, we've got things hopping around, but uh, anyway, God's in charge, amen? Amen. God knows what he's doing, and, and uh, um, I'd like you to go with me to Judges chapter 6 tonight, and uh, verse 11, and I'm going to talk for a few minutes about Gideon, and uh, and it says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree. Um, in the Old Testament, it's interesting when it says, The angel of the Lord. Um, sometimes um, there's an inflection of deity in there. And I, I believe... Uh, Jesus was active in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. <laughs> yes. um, especially, the, the Bible says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The, <clears throat> the firstborn, i.e. protococcus of all creation, and what that really means is not that he was born, but that he was before all creation. And, um, and so we have this uh, situation here. We, we don't know for sure, um, but uh, it's, it's just an interesting inflection. Several places in the Old Testament what's going on. And so when Abraham spoke to God, as they were going to check out Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham was speaking face to face with somebody. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There were two angels with him and then one angel and so we follow this path. And uh, uh, if God is spirit and he is not made tangible or visible by our natural means. Who did Abraham talk to? If he talked to something that was the image of God, who was he talking to? He's talking to Jesus. Yep. I don't see any way around it. So anyway, um, uh, the Lord the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was an opera, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon <laughs> said to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all those miracles which our fathers told us about? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us in the hands of the Midianite. Then the Lord turned to him <laughs> and said, Go in this mighty years, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Um, it's interesting um, because I see a little of this going on in our church. The angel shows up and says, 
Hail, the mighty men of valor. While Gideon is hiding in threshing wheat. Oh, I, I don't know what it is about God. Um, he kind of blows your mind. He shows up out of nowhere. And uh, our life is going perfectly lousy and he gives us a job to do. <laughs> and then he speaks into his life and he says, you are a mighty man of valor. And in our natural ability, in Gideon's natural ability, he wasn't a mighty man of valor. But God said, you're a mighty man of valor. And obviously from Gideon's conversation with the Lord, you saying, well, what happened since all the miracles and God has forsaken us and we're not seeing the deliverance of the Lord? And, of course, if you read the book of Judges, you'll see patterns of where they served the Lord, then they went into idolatry, and then they went into slavery, and then back into serving the Lord again, and things were well with them, and then down again, and, and you can follow the path all the way through the Judges, and... And that was the way Israel was. And uh, actually, it was that way through the kings. Yes. <laughs> the same, same situation altogether. But what is, what is significant about this is God comes, and Gideon had this burden on his, on his heart. And I, I believe a lot of times God gives us burdens and bothers us with things because he intends to use us to solve the problem. And he has an anointing for us that we're not aware of. And we say, well, who am I? I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm, my family is not, I'm not rich enough, I'm, you know, and we have all these things that we say and, and God um, takes the burden of our heart, and you say, well, this is just Gideon. Well, God did the same thing with Moses. Moses is out there on, uh, makes a perfectly uh, miserable situation and ends up on the backside of the desert. But he had a burden on his heart for the Israeli people. And he had it from a young age because he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In other words, he chose rather to be identified with the Israelites. Um, and God sometimes, without us realizing it, puts purpose in our life that we're not aware of. We're not always aware of the things that God is doing in our lives and what he is putting on us or, or what he wants to accomplish through us. Um, Moses tried to do a deliverance way too early. Um, and got in trouble largely because I believe of his temper, which cost him throughout his life. He failed to conquer that aspect of his personality. A lot of interesting stuff is going on in these stories of, of the Bible. But here God is, is talking to him and he's saying, um, uh, Gideon, you're a mighty man of valor. And when God speaks to us, his word paves the way to what he wants us to do. His word accomplishes that. And a lot of times God will give us a burden, maybe for a neighbor, maybe for a friend, maybe for a ministry. Uh, who knows what all God is going to give us a burden for. But in the process, God has an anointing to go with the burden. And an anointing is a grace or an enablement to be able to accomplish that which we could not do in our own natural power. 
For some reason, God likes to take man and take us totally out of our own ability. And Gideon clearly was in no place to, uh, <laughs> to do this. But after the word of the Lord came to him, all of a sudden, step by step, he went through the situation, crazed a great stir uh, when he tore down the altar of Baal, um, got everybody's attention, and before you know it, God had an anointing on his life, and he was leading an army, and Previously, he was too scared to thresh wheat out in the open. But all of a sudden, God was speaking to him. I, I love the story of Gideon because God took him step by step. He didn't just send him, but he took him step by step and kept talking to him through the process, through the selection of who would be in the battle. Uh, took him down to the tents. Uh, to listen to the conversation, <laughs> on and on and on, step by step. And you know, in our process of what God wants us to do, God will continue to speak to our hearts if we just keep listening to him and say, okay, God, I don't know where I'm going from here. You're going to have to give me the next step because, because this just isn't making a whole lot of sense to me. And and so God does that. and And... Why does he do it? Well, um, the trouble is it's, it's not our thoughts. Um, and, uh, and a lot of times the thing God wants us to do is something that uh, we were opposed to. Um, something we didn't want to do or something we weren't particularly good at. Um, here in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, um, uh, verse 4, it says, just as he chose us in him. And I just want to stop there for a minute. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He chose you before the foundation of the world. Um, and it doesn't mean that the thing he chose us for is necessarily easy. Paul's life wasn't easy. Peter's life wasn't easy. And we have this idea that if God's going to really use us, the heavens are going to open, and the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth, and God's going to have a golden stair step all the way up to the place of ministry, and we're just going to walk through it, and it's just going to be a wonderful event. But Paul said it was the sufferings of the present time. <laughs> that were to be uh, compared with the glory of the Lord. Not, um, not the high peaks of our life. And, and God chooses and men try to disqualify themselves. I'm not tall enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not young enough, I'm not... In my case, I just came off a ladder and I'm having trouble sitting or standing. <laughs> but God doesn't choose us in our comfort zone. He doesn't we may have a burden on our heart, but he doesn't necessarily ask us to do what is easy. He just asks us to do. And so much of ministry has got nothing to do. I was, uh, we had some event at uh, Victory Assembly and I was there with a the pastor and spent a number of years ago that pastor's gone now, but we were there and there was a big fellowship and the gym and a bunch of tables were set up and after it was all over and everybody left, 
He was there rolling up tables, putting away chairs. I joined him. <laughs> and we say a lot of times, well, see, but we have an example of one who washed the disciples' feet. We have the example of one that wasn't too good to be around people that were rough around the edges. We have an example of one who left the glories of heaven to suffer and die on a cross, who had his dwelling and rightful place in the glories that we have no comprehension of, really. We have a little bit of a guess, but I am sure that our, we will have such a sense of surprise when we enter over the other side. I don't think throughout all eternity we will fully comprehend or grasp all that he is. I think he's far beyond our ability to grasp that. And yet he knows us. He chose us in him. He chose you. He chose you. <laughs> he chose you. <laughs> See, those are three different statements, aren't they? He chose you. He chose you. He made a choice. But also, he chose you to be where you are. So well, I don't feel effective. I was uh, listening to uh, a man that was having a revelation from the Lord caught up into heaven and uh, and it was Bobby Connors if any of you know and God's the Lord said to him look and he says when God says look at something you look <laughs> the Lord says look and he looked down and here was this little old lady in a rocking chair, or a chair, sitting there reading her Bible. And after she read her Bible, she slowly got up, as an older person would, turned around, got down in her chair, and began praying. And the Lord said, you see that? He says, there's more power in her prayer than all the armies of the earth. Mm -hmm. And see, the devil wants to tell you, you're not important, but you're chosen of God. That's right. Amen. Yes. That you're weak, but the reality is you're strong yes. in him that he has put you in a place of authority and power to do whatever job that God has called you to do, even though you think it's impossible. Because it's not God doing the possible through us, it's God that does the impossible through us. And we don't figure we can do it. Um, Years ago, there was a man that uh, my father went to see. His name was William Branham. And it was in a meeting in Tucson. And I think he had about a sixth grade education and uh, was not highly educated, but had such a gift of revelation and word of knowledge 
you could sit there and tell you your name and your address and the burden on your heart and the calling that God had on your life. And he told my dad that he was a minister and that he had a burden for Honduras and just right on down the line, everything was entirely accurate. What was that? Well, it wasn't a man with a sixth grade education talking. It was a man that just simply said yes to God and was willing to be used of God as a result of God calling him. Now, around all great men, there have been some dysfunction. We know that human beings want to make heroes out of men rather than God. <laughs> but um, uh, there's more to that story, but I, I, it's not the subject of tonight. So what is it? I think there are times in our life where we have to just simply stop and say, Lord, I need your help. Amen. Because this journey. And have you ever felt like you were writing checks that your body couldn't cash? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lord, I'm headed off again to do something. Lately, I've, I've gone through a time of weakness, and I've been fighting heavily because I've, I don't know whether it's COVID coming back to attack me again, or I don't think I've got COVID, but I, the weakness is, is, comes back and gets me, and sometimes I just can hardly function. I say, Lord, I need your help to make it through. I need your strength. I need you to help me. I need to be able to spend a day without wanting to fall asleep at a moment's notice. <laughs> I need to be functional in all these things. There's, a, there's an interesting scripture here in, in Romans 8 that uh, is talking about also the chosen and the call of God. In verse 30. And he says this, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? Hallelujah. If God is for us, I, I want you to just think about that. Now, if God calls you, He's for you. If God puts something for you to do in life, He is for you. He's not against you. He's not trying to make it difficult for you, even though it's difficult. You're not fighting God. You're fighting some of the hordes of hell, but you're not fighting God. If God be for us, who can be against us? You say, well, I'm trying to serve God the best I can, but this is falling apart and that's falling apart and I can't do this and I can't do that. No. If God is for you, who? Who? Can be against you. But I've got an unsafe loved ones and I don't know what to do with them. No. You don't understand. <laughs> if God is for you, See, we have, we have to have the knowledge and the belief within ourselves that God chose us and God is for us. And as long as we think that God never chose us or God isn't for us, we have a hard time praying effectively. 
to that end. But sometimes it's circumstantial. God, you put me in this dysfunctional family. <laughs> Why? Come on. Yeah, that's right. God, you put me around these people. You called me to this situation. How do you know God calls you in the situation? He sticks you in there. And God stuck me in quite a few interesting situations. But our determination is, is that we would please Him. Our determination is we will pray into that that is a burden on our heart. And we will pray and say, God, it's your will for them to be saved. It's your will for their lives to change. It's your will for things to go differently than the way they're going right now. God, you have a plan. God, you have a purpose. God, you put me in your purpose, but I don't know everything. And I, I will tell you something. It's nice when God tells you something prophetically. But just because God tells you something prophetically, there's a whole world of stuff out there that he did not tell you. Amen. And God may have told you one thing, but he didn't tell you the whole story. Because you don't have enough time on this earth for him to tell you the whole story. <laughs> That's going to take eternity to unwrap that one. But... If God be for us, who? Even the demonic world is a who. Oh, yes. Come on. Oh, yes. Who? Come against us. That's right. Try. Jesus, the creator of the universe, creator of all things. even built those that rebelled against God and opposed Him. And we need to keep in mind that if God made them, God knows how to break them. I have never made anything in my life that I couldn't break easier than I made it. <laughs> That's true. That is true. And I have made a few things. But it's far easier to tear it up than it is to. We've got one more scripture I want to read tonight. It kind of goes along with this in 1 Corinthians 1. Verse 26. You know, it's kind of funny. We have mom's time out. And, and we've got people in this church doing stuff that totally out of their <laughs> normal activities. Mm -hmm. Went into the nursery the other day and and Les is sitting there balancing two babies. <laughs> I think he's headed for Alaska right now. But anyway, um, it's in 1 Corinthians uh, one twenty six. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Isn't it funny that God... <laughs> goes around the supremely qualified. <laughs> or he does, does like he did with Paul. He sits at the feet of Gamaliel. Paul's got all kinds of Jewish history and knowledge and ability, can expound on the law. He can answer any question that needs to be asked. And who does God send him to? 
the Gentiles. <laughs> who know nothing about the law, couldn't care less about the law, <laughs> don't even know who Gamaliel is and don't care. But God sends him there. Uh, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And I think in verse 29, it kind of wraps it up and it says that no flesh should glory in his presence. There's two aspects to this. One, we should, of course, not believe that it was all us that did it if we see something miraculous happen. We are to glory. We're to glory in Him, but not gloat about ourselves. But also the satisfaction is the knowledge that it wasn't us. That God showed up. We happened to be there. But God showed up with us. And that is our rejoicing. That we took a step for him and God showed up with us. And we prayed for somebody and God touched them. And sometimes we pray for people and we don't think anything's going to happen. But it does. But it does. And sometimes the simplest it's not the quality of our prayer. It's the fact that we do pray. That makes a difference. Um, I fully believe that, that when the rapture occurs and all the saints are lifted off this earth, this world is going to change so fast in the wrong direction. I don't think we have any idea what the effect of our prayers and the presence of the Holy Spirit upon us is making. And there have been a few times in my life when, when I, I just noticed because yet I believe it's our purpose to just practice the presence of God. Does that make sense? We need to be in a place of prayer, a place of presence, a prayer, a place of just seeking God. And uh, there have been a few times that, that I've walked into situations where the enemy was obviously at work. And I've seen things change when I walked in. And I knew it wasn't me. But it was the one that walked in with me. Amen. See? And there's one that walks with you. And the closer we walk with him and the closer the fellowship that we have with him, the more likely we are to see the hand of God move around us. Isn't it fun to watch God move around us? Yes, it is. Yes. Hallelujah. Let's stand together tonight and let's just pray and say, Lord, would you make me sensitive? Lord, make me sensitive to your Holy Spirit that I don't miss opportunities. But also, Lord, let me be a carrier of your presence. God, let there be nothing in my life that you would want to run away from. 
but Lord, let me be able to host your presence and upon my life in such a way that God, I see you working in places that I go. Lord, I pray that you would anoint us to be light, anoint us to be joyful, anoint us to be carriers of peace every place that we go, that, Lord, the fruit of the Spirit will be manifest in our midst. And, Lord, that your anointing would just bless your people and bless those around us and, and would speak to those needs that are in people's lives. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. You say amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you for coming.